our experience is really the, the mover and uh, the driver and the mover with changing things. So we really have to experience something ourselves. We can't just say, oh yeah, that guy said it's true. We have to actually experience this. Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. We've got Dr. Judd in the house. My man, good seeing you. Good to see you. Very excited about this. Uh, we're talking about habits, overcoming addiction, and how our minds think about these things. And you've been studying flow, habits, addiction, neuroscience for how many years now? 20. 20 years of research. You've done a lot of content materials on this. You had a TED Talk that blew up, top five most watched TED Talk of the year on the power of habit and really how to change addiction and all these different things. Um, I'm curious, why do you obsess over this in the first place? Did you have some type of addiction yourself or did you feel like you were never able to get into flow or something was always distracting you? Or what was the, the main cause? I had no idea how many addictions I had until I started studying this stuff. Really? Like, give me a few. <laughs> Uh, thinking, <laughs> self, love, uh, exercise, <laughs> yeah. So the addiction, what were the addictions like? Were you overly addicted to working out and too much love or was it you didn't know how to love yourself the right way and you didn't work out well? The love piece was around romance. I just loved that excited, mm. you know, like romance piece of the relationship. So the first six months. <laughs> so you were good at like starting a relationship, but not staying in a relationship. You know, my mom used to say, don't tell me her name for the first three months. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Because it was just like always another one, huh? Well, I don't know. You know, I don't want to paint myself in a certain way. Sure. But let's just say, um, you know, those first three months, my mom called that the the infatuation stage. Yeah. Um, and that's that that's really sticky. It's really addictive. So addictive. Yeah. But how come? Why does that eventually fade? Well, our brains habituate, you know, our, our brains actually are set up all these things, whether it's being addicted to thinking or addicted to distraction with social media or whatnot. All these things are actually based on a very basic learning principle, which is set up for survival. We have this caveman brain that says, I need to remember where food is and I need to avoid danger. And it's actually relatively simple. There are these three elements. There's a trigger, a behavior and a reward or a result of that behavior. And that drives a huge amount of behavior. So for example, like with the survival piece, you see food, you eat food, and then your stomach sends this dopamine signal to your brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. Mm. Do the same thing for you know, avoiding danger so that we can, you know, the reward is that you don't get eaten by the saber tooth tiger sure, or whatnot. Sure. Okay, so you got, the, you were in a pattern of, why do we, if our brains are designed to do that, then why are we, why do we have to fight against it so much? As opposed to say, well, I'm just going to jump from relationship to relationship to have that feeling. That's my, the way my brain is designed. Why fight against that? Well, our, the, there's, there are a lot of benefits to setting up habits. So you can even think of this as a habit. We can get addicted to the, um, to the chase, for example. A lot of people, they're really excited about a relationship for the pursuit piece. <sighs> and then as soon as they land it, they're like, ah, oh, you know. I, 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 this isn't, you know, it's not you, it's me. Right. And it's me because I'm addicted to the chase, yes. which is the part that they don't even know. <laughs> but that piece is set up to actually help us set up habits so we don't have to relearn everything every day. So think of uh, getting up in the morning, and if you had to relearn how to walk, how to put on your clothes, how to tie your shoes, how to eat food, you'd be exhausted by breakfast, right? So it's, it's set up to help us learn things. I think of this as like set and forget. Like mm -hmm. set up this habit and then forget about it. And if you can forget about it, then you, it frees your brain up to learn other things. Sure. And that, that process just gets carried along evolutionarily where in modern day when food is plentiful and there's Tinder and whatnot, um, that, that, can get, that can become problematic. Sure, because say. the addiction to junk food feels amazing in the moment, but then you feel bad later. The addiction to the chase feels great for three months, then it feels bad when you have to do it all. You know, once you lose the connection, you become disconnected. I'm sure same thing with cigarettes or drinking or whatever it may be. Yes, these all follow that same basic yeah. habit pattern. Gotcha. So what was the hardest addiction for you to overcome yourself? That's a great one. I think 
and it's not like I'm, let's say I'm a, a recovering thinker. Okay. <laughs> so the addiction to thinking is a big one for me. In what ways? Because you're an academic researcher, uh, teacher, so you have to think. I do. And so it doesn't mean that thinking is a problem, but when I get ad addicted to my own thoughts, for example, like as a scientist, you know, if I have a great idea or what my brain thinks is a great idea, and I lock it in and I'm like, this is the world's greatest idea. This is, you know, and I start telling everybody that's the best idea. You know, I might not get a great reputation for being humble for one thing. And if somebody does a scientific experiment that says, you know, your, your idea is wrong and I rail against that, I'm actually no longer a scientist. Because you, as a scientist, you're actually saying, here's a, a hypothesis. Right. Everyone else go prove me wrong. Right. That's the whole point. That's the beauty of science, is that we don't believe our own hype. We set a hypothesis, and we're just as happy to have it disproven as we are to have it proven. Because then what? Someone finds a solution to whatever the hypothesis is and the actual answer? Yeah. And that's what science is all about, is helping move humanity forward as compared to preserving a legacy, which is me. You know, there's this- I'm always right. Right. I have the answers. Right, right. That's, you, how, how fun would that be to hang out with that type of person? So are all scientists super humble then? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> there's, there's a joke in physics um, that physics progresses one funeral at a time. Okay. <laughs> this, was, this was back in the early 1900s when there were a lot of really big names in physics. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the young folks were like, well, I don't know, you know, this. And, and the old guys had so much clout that basically you had to wait until they died off to put new ideas forward. Wow, okay. So the addiction to thought and the thoughts you had mostly were what? Oh, name. I mean, it's just the, the thinking process itself can be really exciting. It's like, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? And I think it stems somewhat from just a natural curiosity that I've probably mm -hmm. always had. Curiosity, great thing. We can certainly talk more about that. But also, you know, curiosity can kind of morph into, oh, that's moving from like, that's a great idea to that's my great idea. And that addiction mm. to self, like, oh, check me out, mm. <laughs> you know? The ego. Yeah, the ego is problematic. Gotcha. So uh, you had that for how long, do you think? Oh, my whole life. I, you know. Until when? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's still there, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you were, you're now aware. How did you learn to break that addiction? Well, it's interesting. That habit? Yeah, when you look, when I started looking, and I, I started doing a lot of meditation practice myself, I would go on uh, silent meditation retreats and things like that to really start to look inward and look at my own mind and to see what was causing me suffering. And one of the big things that was causing me suffering was being addicted to my own thinking, addicted to myself. You know, it's like, hype, oh, you're on hype. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it doesn't, when, when I really looked at it carefully, it doesn't feel very good. To be addicted to your hype. Yeah. Because why? Why doesn't it feel good to be right, to be have a good an ego where people say you're amazing and you're so smart and talented? Why does that not feel good? Because egos need to be fed. And so what if we can find something that steps out of that process that keeps the loop going? You know, so if if the trigger is that um, you know, somebody says, Oh, that's a great idea, and I start, you know, the behavior is that I get all puffy chested, I'm like, yeah, that is a great idea. There's that reward that comes in the form of excitement, and that needs feeding. You know, it, you, then I, I need more compliments, or I need more people saying that's a great idea, or I'll come up with more great ideas. It's a lot of pressure you know, for the ego to keep itself going in that way. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that we can actually step out of that process and find something that is more rewarding. So this actually relates to habits. Um, the only way that we can change habits is to update that reward value. And that there are two, two pieces to updating the reward value, but it's helpful to kind of understand how they get set up okay. in the first place. So think of, um, you know, a lot of people are trying to lose weight, for example, and maybe they're in middle age and their metabolism isn't what, they, what it was when they were mm, six. Yeah. But think of all the birthday parties that they went to where they associated cake and ice cream with presents, fun, friends, and all that. So their, their mind sets up this habit around cake, has this, cake and ice cream have this certain value. And we have a part of our brain called the orbitofrontal cortex that actually stores this whole hierarchy of reward values. So when we're presented with cake, it's back in our six-year-old brain that says, this is great. 
when we're in our 40 or 50 year old body that's like, you know, my metabolism, can can we slow down on this cake a little bit? Um, And we can't use our thinking brain, our thinking part of our brain, which is the youngest and the weakest part of the brain from an evolutionary perspective to overcome the feeling body because that old part of the brain says, this is great, do it. But it's really just our, you know, our six-year-old brain and our forty-year-old body, and that's that's problematic. Sure. So these things get set up and laid down, and the only way to change those habits is to give our brains accurate and updated information now. Like what? Well, literally paying attention to the results of the behavior. So I'll give you an example from some of the science that we've done. Um, we we do a lot of work with helping people quit smoking, for example. Sure. And uh, the one of the first things that we did in, in one of our first studies here was that we had people pay attention as they smoked. So uh, there's one guy that I'm thinking of who was smoking 40 years, okay? So a pack a day for 40 years, that's 20 cigarettes a day. We calculated it out, it was about, he had reinforced that habit loop 293,000 times. Oh my gosh, of right? smoking a cigarette. Yep, smoking a cigarette. 200, almost 300,000 times. 300,000 times, so that was a pretty ingrained habit for him. So we said, okay, pay attention as you smoke. What does that mean, pay attention? So what does it taste like? What does it, the smoke smell like? And all this stuff, right? Just really pay attention to the process in this moment to give his brain accurate and updated information. Say, how good is this really? Not your 13-year-old brain that was rebelling or trying to be cool or whatever that then got laid down as a habit and then you just smoke. You don't pay, and most people are looking at their phone when they're smoking, right. they're not paying attention. Well, he paid attention. I'm, I'm thinking of somebody um, who just described this beautifully who said, you know, smells like stinky cheese and tastes like chemicals, yuck. When he actually paid attention. Yeah, yeah, so they start to see, wait a minute, cigarettes actually taste like shit. Right, <laughs> they right. don't taste good. Yeah. That's why, that's why <laughs> um, e-cigarettes have flavors, uh-huh. right? To make, to mask. More them. addictive now. Yes, yes. yes. We, <laughs> yes. We My brother was smoking for probably 20 years and we, fu- I, I shouldn't say I, not saying credit, but trying to get him off of it for 20 years. He finally stopped smoking. Great, victory. Starts e-smoking and justifies how it's better for you and this and that, but we can go into science there, but it's a different addiction. I guess yeah. it's the same addiction. Still nicotine, yeah. Still nicotine. Yeah, and still hooked on the loop. Yeah. So, so that, back to that story, this guy started paying attention, seeing that cigarettes didn't taste very good, and helped his brain get that accurate, updated information that sees, oh, the reward value of smoking is not actually that great, which actually opens up the space for uh, what I think of as the BBO, a bigger, better offer. Uh, I'll give another example. Um, a guy who, uh, who came in to my clinic um, was referred to me for a panic, you know, a panic disorder. He came in, he was, he was actually looked pretty nervous when, uh, when he walked in the door. And when I took his history, it turns out that he had such bad fear of driving. He was terrified that he would get in a car accident on the highway that he would barely drive. He basically isolated himself to his house. So just driving a couple of miles to my clinic was already tough for him. The other thing I noticed about him was that he was, he was very overweight, okay? And so for him, the first thing that we needed to do was just map out what his habits were and what his habit loops were. And it turns out that you know, he had this habit around being afraid of things. He gave an example of going out to dinner with his girlfriend and then having this thought, like maybe I'm allergic to fish. They were at a sushi restaurant. And he got so freaked out, his rational brain was saying, you're not, you're, you're not you're allergic not, to fish. Yeah. And he knew this rationally, but his, his feeling body was like, get, let's get out of here, and they had to leave. So we, we've developed these, um, wow. these app-based mindfulness training programs to just help people pay attention and map out their habit loops. So I gave him, we have one for anxiety called Unwinding Anxiety. I gave him this app, sent him home. Two weeks later, he came back, and he said, he had this big smile on his face. And I said, what's up? And he said, I lost 14 pounds. And I said, wait, I thought we were working on anxiety. anxiety yeah. <laughs> you know, he had panic disorder, he had generalized anxiety. And he said, you know, I realized that I would eat as a way to um, work with my anxiety. I'd feel a little bit better by eating, but I realized that the reward wasn't actually that great. So I just stopped stress eating. I was like, wow, I don't feel good about my body because I'm overweight and it's not helping my anxiety. So he just like stopped, <laughs> he mm-hmm. lost 14 pounds in two weeks. He came back, um, what, four, three, four months later, he'd lost 50 pounds. Wow. He came back a couple of months later, and um, his anxiety was so much better. So he'd lost 84 pounds, I think, at this point. His blood pressure was back to normal where it was high. 
he was an Uber driver now. Oh my God. So this driving, guy, the guy was afraid of driving. Now an Uber driver because, so that highlights the key element of how we actually change habits. One, we map out these habit loops and he was able to map his out so clearly that he could see, okay, this is exactly what's happening. But the second piece is seeing how unrewarding they are, right? Eating to work with his anxiety wasn't helping him. So he stopped stress eating, mm -hmm. lost a bunch of weight. But he also realized that he could start to get curious about his experience uh, and that that could actually provide that bigger, better offer. So curiosity itself is kind of like this superpower that comes mm. with awareness that can actually help us break a bunch of different habits. So when someone comes to you and is struggling with addiction, what is the first thing that you would have someone do if they were self-assessing themselves? Yeah. If they don't have the time to talk to you or a therapist or an addiction specialist or a habit specialist. Is it, let's create a list of all your fears and anxieties and addictions currently or habits? What, what is the process? I would have them map out what their top habit loop is. Positive and negative habits? Any habit? Any of them. Like I get up at 6 a.m. every morning. Yeah. I brush my teeth every yeah. day. I, I go to the gym at 9 a.m. every day. Yeah. And I smoke a cigarette during lunch or whatever it is. Everything. Yeah. And I would say start with the, the biggest ones, especially the ones that are causing problems. Okay. We can come to the okay. positive ones in a little bit because those we can actually foster by bringing awareness in as well. But the negative habits, the ones that are causing problems, those are a great place to map things out because those, it's, it's much easier to see them because it's causing pain. Yeah, I'm a smoker. I smoke every day. Go. I'm a yeah. drinker. I drink, a, you know, I eat junk food every day. Yeah. What is the five or six common addictions that most people have, I guess, in America that you see? That I see, well, I work a lot with, not only with addictions, but also with anxiety and overeating. So I would say uh, in the top hits, one of the big ones is worrying. <laughs> worrying about the future. That's a habit. That is a habit loop. It's negatively reinforced. Okay, because you're constantly wor I guess our brain is designed to worry. Yeah, well. <laughs> Keep us alive, right? <laughs> So worrying doesn't necessarily keep us alive, but our brain is designed to plan for the future. Uh -huh. So what our brain's trying to do is minimize uncertainty. So it's trying to map out, okay, how is this gonna play out? And if I can know exactly how, how it's gonna play out, either good or bad, my brain, I feel better, right? Even if I know it's gonna suck, at least I know it's gonna suck. Yeah. That uncertainty is worse than knowing it. Okay, so worrying is a top, a top one. Top one there, yeah. Um, some of the common ones, I mean, smoking is still one of the key killers really? out there. Yeah, yes it is, and e-cigarettes aren't helping. Wow. Um, with this, <laughs> this poor teen population that's getting addicted. Teens are now addicted to e-cigarettes more than anything, it seems like. Yeah, I just saw a study that uh, found, it was like 27% of high schoolers had used no an e-cigarette in the last month, which is like, the rates are going the, in the wrong direction, right? That, that's up. Yes, they're going up, it's terrible. Why, is it because of worry and stress and anxiety? Is it because it's, everyone's doing it and so you pick it up? Well, and, and nicotine now tastes like mango and mint. It doesn't taste like smoke and <laughs> yeah. tobacco, right? You've got this cool futuristic looking thing that looks like a USB drive that gives you this crazy cloud of, of stuff that you can you know, puff out of your mouth. It looks futuristic, cool, and tastes like mango. I mean, what teenager wouldn't want to try that I mean, out? Great marketing, just bad product. Yes, I'm not sure how those folks sleep at night. I don't know, it's crazy. But they market to get people addicted to something negative. Yes, it's so not adding especially, value to their life. Right, especially if you can mask all of the negative aspects to it. So with cigarettes, because yeah, yeah, wow. nicotine's a toxin, right? So with cigarettes, back in the old days, uh, kids had to get overcome the nausea that comes with their first cigarette, right? And you know, if parents caught you smoking, they'd make you smoke a 10 cigarettes, so you'd throw up. So you'd associate the, the throwing up with smoking a cigarette. Why do people get nauseated? Because nicotine is a toxin. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so they can mask all that stuff and make, make it taste like mango, and then voila, 27% of high school students. <laughs> so we've got the smoking, we've got worrying, what are some other addictions or habits? A drinking has always been a big one. Uh -huh. And you can see, I, I remember a patient that was referred to me for alcoholism actually. Um, and it turns out that he would drink as a way to mask his anxiety. So there are a lot of people that socially drink for, to help with social anxiety. There so, are it's a lot of, a, so it's a double addiction. Worry is the addiction, is, the, is like the main addiction that I'm hearing. 
but then drinking is like another addiction to mask one addiction. Yes, often drinking has a comorbidity or something that comes along with it. And anxiety is one of the big ones that I see. So this guy, for example, was anxious. He would drink to make himself not feel anxious. And then it took him a while. So when he came in to see me, I first had him map out those loops. And he realized, oh, I was, I'm drinking to work with my anxiety. Why don't I just work with my anxiety itself? And he was able to quit drinking uh, <laughs> because he's like, wow, it, this is you know, too many calories. It's expensive. I get a hangover. I can't work in the morning, all these things. He saw the negative aspects to that, which is the second piece, right? Map it out. See how unrewarding that old habit is. And then you can replace it with something that's a, better. Is that bigger, better offer? That bigger, better offer, the BBO. I guess because there's always a reward for the habit. There's some type of feeling, reward, relief. Yes, yes. Payoff for the price you pay. There right? is. That's how reward-based learning works. I'm glad you bring that up because a lot of people think, oh, if I'm going to change a behavior, I need to focus on the behavior. I'll just use my willpower and you know, grit my teeth and, you know, white knuckle Just say no to it every day. Right. But that's not how our brains learn. Our brains learn based on the reward, how rewarding something is. Mm -hmm. So if we can focus on that part, we can actually hack that process and help our brain see, oh, if it's a cigarette or over, you know, uh, drinking too much or whatever, it's not that rewarding. That's what helps us start to change the behavior without having to force ourselves to do it. Because our brain just says, why would I do that? That's, not, that's right. not so good. So step one is the assessment of what are the bad habits. Yes. Step two is the w figuring out what's the reward you're getting for this. Yeah. What do I get from this? So, so we have the people using our app-based programs, whether it's eating or anxiety or smoking, to ask the simple question, what do I get from this? Not in a thinking way, right? Like, oh, I could get cancer because that, that thinking part of our brain doesn't hold the candle to like, right. oh, what's this feel like? How do I feel? Yeah. yeah. So what's it feel like when I overeat? You know, oh, my stomach gets this gut bomb. Um, I feel, you know, I get a sugar rush and crash if I eat junk food or whatever. We can, that's that second piece is really diving into our direct experience. And that's what either reinforces or unreinforces old habits. Okay. And then what's the step after that? That BBO. We're, cu we're cured. Like <laughs> we think about it, we understand it, we're aware, and then we stop doing it. Well, our brains often think, you know, okay, this isn't so good, but until you give me something better, I'm going to keep doing so it. So we need a bigger, better offer. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to just cut something cold turkey in our brains. Is what it, I'm it can be much more challenging, absolutely. People have done it, I'm sure, where they're just like, okay, I realize I don't want to do this anymore. Not smoking, not drinking, not whatever, the yeah. addiction. But do we know the percentages of when someone tries willpower, cold turkey, without a bigger, better offer, versus when someone has a bigger, better offer, the percentages of... It's shifting. I don't know anybody that's done that experiment yet, mm, but I can. Great. Yeah, that'd be a great experiment for the to next do. book. <laughs> talk. Yeah. Uh, but we do know that willpower really doesn't help that much. So the, the average person, last time I looked at these statistics, the average person that quits smoking, the likelihood that they're going to stay quit a year later is five percent. Off willpower. Yes. Well, in the general, or you in general, add everything together. I quit. I did the patch. I said no. I'm. That's overall 5%, even with a better, bigger, better offer? Well, that's the piece that hasn't been added in yet. So this uh, is where sure. the new science comes Look at in. This. We're, we're bringing you something new you can try now. <laughs> I like this. Well, we've actually been studying this a bit. So for example, knowing, so we've mapped out these, these habit loop processes and really zoomed in on this, this reward devaluation piece. Uh -huh. So there have been these formulas that have been around since the 1970s, this, these researchers, Rescorla and Wagner. So there's this Rescorla-Wagner curve, basically, which sounds kind of fancy. But basically, they said, you know, it, that devaluation piece, if you can devalue something, that's going to really change behavior. And they've lined this up, you know, people have lined this up in, in animal behavior experiments. They've lined this up with dopamine firing. They've lined this up in a bunch of basic science models. Mm -hmm. But I really don't know of anybody that's lined this up with habit behaviors yet. Mm -hmm. So we actually built a, a, a tool right into our Eat Right Now app, this app that helps people work with overeating or stress eating, to see if we could map out that process. And what we do is we have people first just imagine the, whatever the type of food is or the amount of food is that they typically are struggling with, right? And so we have them go through this, uh, this exercise where they remember the last time they ate it. And they just go through that. And then we ask them, well, how's your craving now? And if they're really still excited about it, their craving is either going to stay the same or go up, right? Because they're like, oh, ice cream. Mm, I'm thinking about Now it, yeah. I really want ice cream. Dude, where's the ice cream, right? So that helps us get a sense for how strong the reward value is now. 
And then we have them do a mindful eating exercise where we say, okay, go ahead and eat that amount of food, right? So if they overeat or whatever, but we have them pay attention. In just, their mind. No, 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 we have them actually do it. Get the burger, get the ice cream, yeah, eat go it for all, it. and yep. do it now. Yep, yep, go for it. Okay. And then we ask them afterwards, how was it? How do you feel? <laughs> I feel sick, my stomach hurts, I'm getting a migraine, whatever. Yeah, yeah, so our brains learn from what's called a, a positive or a negative prediction error, as in the, their brain was predicting that it's gonna be this rewarding, remember that five-year-old brain with birthday cake, and if they're like, wait a minute, this doesn't taste as good as I thought, or eating this amount of ice cream gives me the gut bomb, there's this negative prediction error where their brain says, hey, wait a minute, there's new information here. You need to update this reward value. And what we found, we just finished a study where what we found was it takes about 10 times on average for somebody to really dive into this with eating, that their reward value starts to change. And over with a few more uses, it actually uh, is associated with the change in their behavior. So you do this 10 times where you are aware, you're reflecting on it, you're noticing the feeling, the energy, the t everything, how mm -hmm. you feel. After 10 times of doing this, you start, your body starts to click and you say, actually, I don't want this anymore. That's what it seems. Now, this is also in conjunction with learning mindfulness as they go through this sure. app-based so training they're, program. They're, you've got to do that at the same time. Possibly. Um, but the, one of the key elements may be helping our brains just really see the actual reward value. But as part of that, as I, you know, with the with the training, we also give them the BBO, that bigger, better offer. So, what would the bigger, better offer be for someone who's maybe overweight and eats poorly constantly to 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 mask anxiety or worry or okay, so self doubt? Or... So you tell tell me what would what feels better for you, craving or curiosity? If you're curious about something, what feels better? Yeah, in your body. Or even curious about this question. Curiosity feels better because craving feels like you're a, a slave to something. Yes. It's like you're a prisoner to this craving. I need it now. Yeah. I'll do whatever I take to fulfill this emptiness yes. that I need to fulfill. <laughs> Give me the M&Ms. Give me the ice cream. <laughs> I want the pizza now. Postmates, let's go. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Uber Eats, DoorDash, I'm in. Right, right, and we can we can have food instantaneously, Instantly. almost now. show up at our door. Yeah, right, and exactly. so we can reinforce those habits. The curiosity feels better because uh, you're exploring a different part of your brain. You're you're interested in something different. You're mm -hmm. like wondering what could something else be like. But even that momentary experience, you used a with your hand, you clenched your hand. Yes. So there's this contracted, closed down quality to a craving. Does yes. curiosity feel contracted or closed expansive. down? expansive. Yes. What's the possibility? Yes. So which, if you just took closed versus open or contracted versus expanded, mm. which one feels better? Expanded. Yes. Yeah. So right there, we can give our brain a very clear, bigger, better offer. Mm. Expanded. So for example, when we're caught up in ego and we're waiting for that next compliment, does it feel closed or open? Closed. Yes. How about when you're in flow? Like when you're just totally killing it in sport or playing music or having a great conversation. Feel closed or open? Open. Yes. Bigger, better offer. Boom. Okay. So you reflect on the bigger, better offer of feeling expansive, feeling healthier, happier, more fulfilled. Well, it's not even on what could be. It's right in that moment. moment. We can tap into that Got superpower it. of curiosity. What would the curiosity be? What, what is, as opposed to the craving, what are you curious about? We can get curious about the craving. Oh, what does this craving feel like in my body? And we flip the valence from this closed down feeling of craving being caught up in a craving to, oh, wow, this feels like tightness or tension or, you know, I'm feeling my hand move to my phone to click on, you know, click on the food eating app or whatever. Mm. Oh, wow, wow, wow. And we can just explore our experience in that moment. So we can actually hack craving with curiosity mm. just by bringing it in. Okay. And what if the craving is still there? Then we can get curious about that. Hmm, how long is this going to last? Is it changing? Is it moving in my body? We actually have had people on our program saying, you know, I had a, actually I had a guy walk into my office. I was working at the VA hospital. And he walked into my office and he said, Doc, I feel like my head's going to explode if I don't smoke. And you know, I was young, addiction psychiatrist. I was like, oh, what do I do? So I was like, well, uh, if your head explodes, just put the pieces back together and call me. I was like, <laughs> and he politely laughed, you know, it was like bad joke. But we actually got up and mapped out what head exploding felt like for him. What does it feel like? So he described it as like tightness or heat or um, clenching and things like this. 
And we mapped it out on my, I remember mapping this out with it on my whiteboard where we watched that wave go up and then over. So typically what somebody does is they'll smoke to make it go away. But he realized it goes up and it actually goes away on its own. And that was a big aha for him. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I feel like everything comes back to mindfulness and meditation. It's like the, the, to solve anything in life is mindfulness and meditation. It's what it all seems like it comes back down to over the last few years. I've done so, I've done so much research on meditation myself. I've been to India and re retreats, yeah. Headspace, Calm, had all the meditation teachers on. And it feels like it's the solution to so many things. Is that true? Well, I would say, especially for habits, um, we can see how mindfulness helps teach us that awareness piece that can help our brains get that updated and accurate information. Yeah. So there's actually a pretty good scientific basis around mindfulness helping us with habits. Okay. So, and those habits can extend beyond eating and anxiety and smoking. They can extend to um, getting caught up in, you know, in ego, as we talked about thinking. a little bit. Yeah. yeah they can also extend to being attached to certain views, right? So if there are political parties where one side says, I'm right, and the other part side says, they're right, and they just spend all their time fighting, how are we going to do anything? So what does fighting feel like, closed or open? Closed. How does it feel when people actually collaborate and cross the aisle and say, hey, I want to understand your point of view. I really want to understand it so we can work together. Open. It feels pretty Expansive, darn good. yeah. Yeah. So we can even see how mindfulness can help with these things where you know, people are, are not having a good relationship or, or societies are fighting with each other. We can stop, notice how unrewarding the fighting is and how rewarding it is just to remember each other's humanity. Yeah. What is the likeliness then of changing a negative habit without the use of mindfulness meditation? Well, the, the rescorla wagner curve suggests that you really have to get that updated information to devalue the old things. So th there isn't anything else scientifically suggesting that we can change things. It's, you know, it's not about willpower. It's not about magical thinking. You know, it's not it, positive thinking and hoping and wishing. Hoping and wishing doesn't it, fit into the math. The only research says meditation, mindfulness, awareness, however it looks for you, that type of awareness is the only solution. That's what the math is suggesting. So mindfulness helps teach us to be aware and awareness is what helps our brain get, get that updated and accurate. When we have a bigger, better offer. Yeah. Well, that, so the bigger, better offer can come in the form of curiosity or connection or kindness, yes. which or are often taught, taught. Yeah, those are often taught as part of, of part of mindfulness practices, but even feeling physically healthy, mentally healthy feels good. And so that's going to reinforce those, ha those positive habits. So eating healthily feels better than eating a bunch of junk food. I certainly know this myself. Yeah. Um, so when we can really clearly see that cause and effect relationship, it's just much easier to stay on a healthy habit. What is, what is the root of addiction in your mind? You know, I like this really simple definition of addiction, continued use despite adverse consequences. So I would say the root of addiction, because that, you know, ad, continued use despite adverse consequences can be anything from self, being addicted to social media to a point of view. Um, so the, I think the root actually comes in this survival mechanism that's just trying to help us remember where food is. But in modern day, when food is plentiful, you know, most of us have a refrigerator yeah. <laughs> and, right. and restaurants are open 20, you, know, you can find <laughs> yeah. a restaurant open Brain any too. time yeah. of day. Um, that mechanism, that survival mechanism, mechanism is still in place. So I think that the root of addiction is actually, I, you know, paradoxically, there is a survival mechanism. Yet, in modern day, we refine, you know, coca leaves into cocaine. Um, we make we make synthetic opioids so that we can pop pills. Um, we we go on Instagram to look at cute pictures of puppies when we're bored. You know, right, all right, these different right. things that are and food is literally engineered to be addictive now. So that process, that natural survival process, get, has gotten hijacked. Mm -hmm. What is the amount of time it takes to break an addiction that's 10, 20, 30 years old? Is it possible to break it in a moment, a day? Does it take 30 days to break the habit or start a habit? What is the scientific research saying 
is that the longer you've been doing something, the longer it takes to break, or you can still break it in 10 days once you hit that rhythm. Yeah, yeah, it really depends. I'm remembering a guy that came into one of our early studies uh, who was smoking 30 cigarettes a day. And we started with the pay attention when you smoke, see what you get from it. Two days later, he came back and he'd cut 20 cigarettes. And he realized, you know, I get up and I drink coffee and I don't like the bitter taste of coffee, so I smoke a cigarette to cover the taste. Oh, I could just brush my teeth instead. So, you know, so for some people, you know, really clearly mapping it out and seeing how unrewarding the old behavior is helps them change a lot of the habits Quick. pretty quickly. Okay. So, and as I mentioned in some of our uh, now preliminary research, we're seeing with using these mindfulness apps like the Eat Right Now app or the Craving to Quit app that I mentioned, uh, we're seeing after people are using these, um, these craving tools about you know, 10 to 15 times, that significantly changes really? the value of that reward. Right. 10 to 15 times or is that 10 yes. to 15 days? What it's, is that like it that? really so it depends on what the behavior is. So somebody could have their, um, their ice cream craving. And so they can't just like eat ice cream 15 times in one day and do the thing and have it. I mean, they sure, probably sure. feel pretty sick. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. Might help. Um, but it really has to come as part of their natural experience. So, so when you, you know, have the, that, when the craving comes up and you're about to do the addiction, you open up the app, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a guided meditation, there's a, some steps. The apps actually start with helping people map out their habit loops. And so this is some of my, uh, you know, well, I, I learned the most when I fall on my face. Yeah, we all do. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so when I was first starting this research, I had this hypothesis that it would be, you know, these formal meditation practices that would help people change their behavior. You know, I'd been meditating for a while. I'd gone on long retreats. I, you know, would, would sit and meditate for a long time. I was like, this is it. It was great for me. But it turns out when we looked at our data that these informal practices, these in the moment um, practices where people were paying attention as they were smoking or paying attention as they were eating, where that's what was really helping to change the behavior itself. In the moment, not before the moment, when you wake up in the morning, at night, in the moment. Right. So the formal meditation practices can certainly be helpful, but we actually start by helping people map these things out. Because I didn't know, you know, when I first started learning to meditate, it was like, pay attention to your breath, and when your mind wanders, bring it back. I was like, okay, this makes sense. But when I went on, you know, I went on my first meditation, seven day silent meditation retreat, mm -hmm. by like day three, I was crying uncontrollably on the shoulder of the retreat manager. Because I couldn't pay, I was like, I made it through college, I made it in medical school, and now I'm I can't pay attention. I, I can't pay attention. So I thought I was a failure. And it turns out it's not about forcing ourselves to pay attention, right? The, the grit, the willpower doesn't, certainly didn't work for me. It's really about understanding our minds. So instead of like telling people, pay attention to your breath or something like that, we first start by helping them map out how their mind works and map out those habit loops. Then we layer in informal practices and give them like these short bite-sized trainings every day. So like 10 minutes a day, short video, uh, some animation, some in the moment exercises so people can actually layer this right into their busy day. So they can't say, I don't have time to do this. Anybody that has five or 10 minutes a day can actually do the training in the morning and then build that throughout their day. Mm. Then we layer in the formal practices as people start to understand how their habits work, how they're, you know, what they're getting from these old habits and how they can actually um, you know, start to bring in that space for that bigger, better offer. So the aware, the kindness, the curiosity, the awareness, we layer that in afterwards. Yeah. And we've seen some pretty significant results. We just finished uh, two studies with our Unwinding Anxiety program, one with anxious physicians <laughs> who are, I can speak from personal experience, are <laughs> a pain in the ass to work with. Right. And we don't learn any tools, at least we didn't in medical school, learn any tools to, uh, to work with all the difficulty. You know, we're, we're expected to you know, be um, always uh, alert Put and always together, helping people. Yeah. So for example, when you watch a television show or a movie about doctors, do you ever see them going to the bathroom? Never. No, because we're not even supposed to go to the bathroom. Right, right. We're supposed to just be totally Machines. helping yeah, everybody yeah. else and not worrying about ourselves. So that's what we learn in medical school. And always put together and always have the answers. Right. And always. And the white coat is always clean, right? And all, everything, everything. So if you look at that, um, you know, tons of anxious physicians out there. Burnout rates are, are sky high. You know, some describe this even in epidemic proportions. So we actually had them use our own running anxiety program just to see if we could get physicians to engage with this. Within three months, we got a 57% reduction in clinically validated anxiety scores. 
And without teaching them anything about burnout, we got a 50% reduction in some measures of burnout mm. because there's a correlation between like becoming callous toward other people and, and anxiety and burnout. So sure. we were seeing that. And then we just did a, a randomized control trial to make sure you know, this, this was actually legit with people with generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, so people with moderate to severe anxiety, after two months, we got a 60%, 63% reduction in these clinically validated anxiety scores, whereas a control group, no change at all. Wow. We've even mapped this onto the brain, where with our smoking program, the Caribbean to Quit app, we can actually target specific brain regions and show that as those brain regions change in activity, they predict clinical outcomes. So we're seeing everything from behavioral mechanism, you know, with these score the wagner curves, to the brain mechanisms where we're targeting these brain regions that get caught up when we get, um, or get activated when we get caught up in anxiety or craving or whatnot. And all of it, and surprisingly, we can actually apply these digital therapeutics, you know, the basically app-based training programs, yeah. which wasn't even a term several years ago. When we started doing this work, you know, the, the iPhone was just being rolled out and the, the Android phones looked like a big clunky Texas sure. Instruments calculator or right, something like right. that. So we were, you know, we were just like, well, can we use this? And I had this aha moment where I realized, you know, this is, these processes are set up for survival, helping people remember where to find food. People don't learn to smoke in my office. They don't learn to get anxious in my office, hopefully. Right. Um, so can I actually package my office and bring it to them? And so that's where we started taking these manualized, these evidence-based training, cutting them into bite-sized pieces and delivering them via an app. Is there any addictions that you have not been able to overcome yourself? Being the one helping people overcome these addictions through all this training and teaching. Do you still have an addiction? Uh, let's just say that my addictions are much better. Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a whole book about all my different addictions, um, you know, from thinking to love to distraction to whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and certainly over the last 20 years, um, I feel like they are in, in much better control. I have a much better life. I don't feel like I'm a slave to my addictions. Really? So they're, so they're not 100% gone, but you manage them? I, they're not in control of me anymore. That's good. So they're not like, you're not a prisoner to your addictions. Not a, I'm not in prison anymore. Do you feel like everyone has addictions? We all do. It's, we all do. We all do. And you can think of it as any habit that's kind of gotten a little off the rails, a little out of control, right? Continued use despite adverse consequences. What about a positive addiction? Like reading every day or, I don't know, going to work out every day. Right. Or taking care of your health every day. So let's, let's talk about working out. So that was one of, uh, one of the ones that I worked with in terms of being addicted to running. I had to run every day and I would get irritable if I, you know, mm. if I couldn't fit a run in and you know, folks would kind of avoid me until I'd gotten my exercise in right, 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 right. like that. So exercise, obviously healthy um, and helpful for promoting health. I, you know, I'd like to still like to exercise sure. every day, but when it becomes continued use despite adverse consequences. So, uh, if, if we exercise even when we're injured, because we have to get that exercise in, um, that's a problem. We were just, uh, I was just leading a, a co-leading a retreat with the um, Olympic women's water polo team and was talking to some of the athletes and one of them talked about how you know, she could really um, almost basically get into flow through exercise, but has, was really struggling to get, you know, to find that mindset outside of um, outside of sport, outside of exercise. And so the idea here is of being, of be like being in flow in her life, not just for the two hours at the gym or right, in the pool. Right. Yeah. So there, you know, imagine somebody is in that, in that state and they get injured, you know, it can be really devastating. devastating. And we, I see this, I've heard about, um, especially in surfing when folks get injured and that like they were so addicted to that adrenaline rush, which is kind of different than flow, but let's just say that can be even more addictive. Sure. Um, what do they do when they, you know, they're injured and they can't surf anymore? A lot of them turn to drugs because they, they need the rush. Yes. Still. Yeah. So what was once a positive addiction, now you substitute for a negative addiction to have, which is the alternate bigger, better offer because you can't do the thing you love. Yeah, and I'm not sure, you know, a positive addiction, I don't know how many positive addictions are actually out there because anytime we're a slave to anything, that's problematic. What if it's a habit that adds value to your life? Great. 
habits are good. Tying, learn, having to relearn how to tie our shoes every morning, that wouldn't be so great, yeah. right? So tying our shoes, good habit. So what's the difference between a habit and addiction? Continued use despite adverse consequences, okay. right? Tying my shoes doesn't provide adverse consequences for me. Got it. it actually helps me from tripping. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so there's a positive reward. And running every day helps you uh, stay healthier, but being obsessed with running every day, otherwise you're an angry person. Problem. Is a problem. Yeah. It's so, an addiction, not a habit. Yeah. So if I listen to my body and I say, okay, maybe I need a rest day and I take a rest day, that's much better than pushing through that and potentially getting injured. Uh, what if someone feels like, you know what, my life is just kind of, I don't feel fulfilled. I feel like I've got a little worry here. I've got some stress, some uncertainty about the future. My relationships are good, but they're not great. I'm not out of shape, but I'm not in shape. Do you teach people how to develop positive habits that would get their life into a place of more fulfillment as well? And yeah. if so, what should they do? Yeah, I think one of the simplest ways to start to explore that for folks and to start to explore their own lives is through curiosity, really just developing that, um, I would say even just awakening curiosity. Because we all, you know, we all were great at curiosity when we were three. Mm -hmm. You know, we could stare at a blade of grass for hours. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or yeah. whatever. A block, could just right. like turn the block, yeah. A bug, you know, <laughs> bug, bug. Uh, so that curiosity piece helps us tap into what it feels like to be open and that openness We can start to realize that this is actually everywhere. Mm. We have a good conversation with somebody. We're just rest walking outside in nature and you know, just looking at the trees looking at the leaves looking at the grass mm -hmm. whatever we can actually realize there's a ton of of positive feeling that you know that openness that actually is always available we've just been ignoring it so we kind of awaken that piece through fostering curiosity curiosity is step one mm -hmm. curiosity be curious about your life about what's possible taking a breath looking at things in a different way yeah doing that approach yes and so it's critical here because there are two types of curiosity one's this deprivation curiosity where it's like oh who was that? Oh, I saw that person in a movie. What was that? What was her name? Oh, I can't. And then, you know, we, we frantically pull out our phone and you're like, oh, thank God. Now I remember this person's name. N you know, nice trivia, but not going to be a life changer for us yeah. in terms of, you know, helping yeah. us, you know, have these aha moments. Sure. So deprivation curiosity feels very much like an addiction. There's that itchy. We check on Instagram. And, right. Yeah. There's this restless quality that says do something. It's like that destination. We have to get somewhere. So interest curiosity is, is that open um, quality that we've been talking about that's really about being curious about the journey. Like, oh, you know, look at this, this grain of, of wood, isn't that, mm -hmm. you know, and not just isn't that interesting intellectually, but just really letting our senses rip and just letting that feeling of curiosity come pouring, for, pouring yeah. out. Mental illness and mental health is a topic that I've been seeing everywhere people are talking about as um, a struggle that a lot of people are going through and they're opening up about it online and publications. Do you feel like, how important is it to focus on our mental health, part one, and then when someone feels like they are mentally ill, is there a way to solve and end mental disease or mental illness? So part one, critical to focus on at mental health and I think that actually relates to part two as well which is you know disease is often in the eye of the beholder how do we define this stuff and so you can think of anxiety being our planning brain you know trying to um, secure the future kind of going off the rails a little bit so you know can we look at these processes and see what is, what is something that was actually there to help us survive that's kind of gone off the rails a little bit and help that tweak that a little bit so it gets back into the normal range. Uh -huh. So, and that brings us into the range of mental health. Yeah. So I see the two is really inextricably sure. linked. Sure. Is, is, is mental illness something that you can cure? Because a lot of, I hear people saying like, I have a disease, it's mental illness. I can't be cured, but I am accepting of like, the disease and who I am, and I know how to work with it. Is that is that possible? 
Well, if we think of all of life having some elements of it that are out of our control or not satisfactory, uh -huh. right? There are lots of things that we'd all love to have be different. Sure. So think of life as a mental dis-ease, as a not in ease, not easeful. Uh, that extends, I think, to the, what you're describing in terms of mental illness, so to speak. There is a dis-ease, but we can actually learn to be okay with things not being perfect. And in that sense, um, if we're okay with things not being perfect, what's the problem? We don't have the disease, dis dis-ease anymore, yeah. right? We don't have that. Yeah. So we can, in a sense, in a sense cure that worry, stress, dis-ease feeling. Just as an example, with um, there's a lot of work now in the field of schizophrenia where it's helping people see that, oh, they're hearing voices and they can actually relate to their voices differently as compared to thinking, oh, I'm a sick person, I need to take medications. Not that medications aren't helpful, I'm not suggesting sure, sure. that. Um, but it, there's this whole movement that's helping people relate to those voices differently so that they are not fighting against them or thinking there's something wrong with them and start helping them see, oh, well, here are these voices in my head. How can I work with them? And so there's a dis-ease that can be much less dis-easeful by helping us just relate to ourselves differently. And that's really what mindfulness is all about. It's not about changing things. It's about changing our relationship to whatever comes up. If we, you know, what we resist persists. Yes. Now you're talking, you're sounding like a personal development guru. <laughs> what we resist persists. <laughs> You're crossing over to the other worlds. I like it. Um, so what do you suggest everyone start doing to improve their mental health? Uh, whether they feel like life is pretty good right now, but there's going to be some challenges in the future, or I can't even think for a moment. Does it all tap back into mindfulness and meditation and awareness for you? I, I would say it all tops back. It all taps back into helping. We, we really have to understand and know how our minds work. If we don't know how our minds work, we can't work with them. So the yes. first step is know your mind, know how your mind works. How do we know how our mind works? Well, starts with mapping out a bunch of our habit loops and that's gonna be uh, a big step forward. And just once we become familiar with some of these habit loops, the other ones start jumping out of the woodwork. And we're like, oh, I didn't notice this, I didn't notice this, I didn't notice this. So we learn a whole lot about how our mind works just by starting with, you know, think of like some of these cornerstone habits, old, old habits. Mm -hmm. Understand that piece, see that they are actually workable because when we understand our mind works, we can work with our mind, mm. see that they're workable with awareness, start to see you know, all these aspects around um, what, how rewarding is the old behavior, bring in that bigger, better offer that comes with kindness and curiosity. And we're already way down the road at that point. Wow. And what is the difference between mindfulness and overthinking? <laughs> so, <laughs> Curiosity constantly and overthinking. Yes. So overthinking is often where we're caught up in some, some loop. It could be perseveration when we're worried about something. It could be uh, rumination when we're, I can't believe I did that. You know, it's so past and future. We're often lost yeah. in the past and future. So mindfulness is about bringing us into the present moment, noticing when we're lost in any of those habit loops and just being aware of them. So it's, it's really about stepping out of the loop of being caught up mm -hmm. and just seeing them for what they are, not trying to change them, but simply notice, oh, this is happening, this is happening as compared to getting in there and trying to push against them or change them. So as a doctor and scientist, there's you know, thousands of years of ancient wisdom that's been teaching all of us this stuff, right? But it's taken doctors and scientists like yourself to research, to, to find the true meaning or to find the facts of it, I guess, to prove it. Yes. Why, why is that? Why can't we just <laughs> listen to our ancestors and say, you know, it's not that difficult, we're overcomplicating life. Like, why do we struggle so much? Yeah, it's a great- When the answers have always been here. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think there are several aspects to that. One is that in the West, we tend to be kind of addicted to science. So we think, oh, if it's not scientifically proven, it can't be true. Two, <laughs> right, right. Uh, our experience is really the, the mover and uh, the driver and the mover with changing things. So we really have to experience something ourselves. We can't just say, oh yeah, that guy said it's true. We have to actually experience uh -huh. this. And actually, the, the, the Buddha actually said that too. He said, don't believe what I say. Try it, see if it's true for you. 
yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to actually experience things in our own, you know, in our own lives, in our, and have our own experiences to see what is actually true. All of that comes with awareness. So I think those two pieces are at play there. So how do scientists prove religion, God, Jesus? Like, is there a solution and and provenness to all these other things to spirituality, <laughs> like science and spirituality. How do you prove it? That's a great question. I'm going to get really curious about that, but that's way beyond my pay grade. <laughs> gotcha. I'm into habits and helping people gotcha. change habits. As far as those things, hopefully somebody else is really curious about those questions, that's and good. I'd love to see what they come up with. That's great. I like that answer. Um, what's a life worth living for you in terms of the habits we can apply to our life? Mm. I would say the most fulfilling moments of my life are when I'm connected with others, uh, when there's some sort of kindness happening, mm. when there's, you know, I just, I just love developing programs to help people change their lives. It's so fulfilling to uh, have people write into us and say, you know, your, you know, your app changed my life, or I've been anxious for 15 years and I've tried everything, and this is the only thing that's worked. Some guy wrote a review who said, you know, if I could buy this app for everybody in the world, I would, um, because it helped me with my smoking so much. That's what's really gratifying for me is yeah. just seeing, you know, that how we can bring simple principles together, ancient wisdom together with modern science. Uh, mm -hmm. and make these things really accessible for people because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of suffering out there. And it, it, every day, you know, when I get up in the morning and know that I can help move people in the direction away from suffering, that's satisfying yeah. and fulfilling for me. When you're, when you're, you know that your work is making a difference, making an impact. Yeah. What if someone's listening or watching has someone close to them, a family member, a friend, a partner, that they know has been suffering with an addiction for a long time. And they've tried everything. They've tried giving them more love, rewarding them with a bigger, better offer, holding them accountable. They've tried tough love. They've, they've yeah. called them names, you know, tried everything, yeah. um, which I'm sure people have tried. What uh, advice could you give them, whether they were gonna be a part of the app that you have, which I'm gonna recommend everyone do, but even if they didn't do that, what advice would you give them that could potentially help solve the addiction for a loved one? Yeah, I see a lot of people, and a lot of people uh, come to me with this very question. And the first step there I recommend to them is also understanding their own minds. Because if they can understand their own minds, they can see where they might be reactive or mm. where they might have the best intentions but might be feeding something or enabling something um, that isn't as healthy. Uh, so if they can understand their own minds a little bit more, they can actually understand the mind of their loved one and put themselves in their loved one's shoes. And have compassion and not guilt and shame. Yes. And, which I've been, uh, I've done in the past, probably yeah. many times, is making someone feel bad. Yeah, yeah. Which probably doesn't, probably makes them more addicted to the thing, right? Shame, guilt. They are habit loops unto themselves. Right. It probably makes someone want the thing to, to dissolve the shame and guilt more. Yeah. Yeah. So taking awareness of our own brains first and having compassion for the addiction is what you would say is the, a powerful step. Yeah. And then have, have that help people be able to just hold the suffering of somebody else. Because uh -huh. when we're not as worried about protecting ourselves, you know, one thing mindfulness helps us do is to not, you know, not take things so personally. And so often we take things personally and we don't even realize that we're doing it um, in our efforts to help. You know, it might be painful and so we put up the armor or whatever. So as we learn to not take things personally, that opens us to be able to be with the suffering of others. And as you pointed out, that compassion can naturally arise. And just being with somebody and holding their suffering can be tremendously healing unto itself. So healing. That's probably one of the hardest things as, uh, as a human can do, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm assuming it's one of the hardest things to not be triggered by your own uh, taking offense-ness to something that someone did, taking something personally, a wall. It's probably one of the hardest things to, to notice the trigger 
say, I'm not, I'm going to take my ego out of my chest and put it over here <laughs> on a table, <laughs> look at it and not let it affect me and be with the suffering of someone yelling or attacking or pushing a button of yours that triggers you and just be with them. Yeah. yeah. Why is that so hard to do that? Do you feel like it's hard for you still it's, after all this time? It's practicing? hard for everybody. So it's, it's goes back to these survival mechanisms that say danger, danger, danger. And we have to be able to realize whether something is dangerous or whether something isn't dangerous. And if somebody is verbally attacking us or something and we push back, then that can just es escalate things as compared to being with that suffering and not, you know, not being that, that, um, reaction. Touch yeah, yeah. Yes. Do you, do you notice yourself ever reacting still to situations that maybe trigger you or, Oh, sure. Really? Still today, <laughs> even as the guy who's got the answers, who's got the research that <laughs> I still have to practice. Yeah. <laughs> But I would say every day, every moment as I practice and feel the, the sweetness that comes with connection, with kindness, uh, with letting go, mm. it gets easier and easier. Wow. You're a sweet scientist. <laughs> you've got a sweet heart, like a kind heart. It's amazing. You're, you've got the analytical brain and the emotional side of you, which is really nice to see mm. because most, I shouldn't say most, but sometimes you see a doctor or scientist that's just all analytical and no heart, and I really see your heart, so I appreciate that. Um, this is a question I ask everyone towards the end. Well, before I ask this, is there anything else we should under know about habits that I'm missing here that's really important for us to know about, about building a positive habit? Um, so let's touch on building positive habits a little bit. So we've yeah. talked about how to unwind some of these old habits, uh, and uh, I think Noticing the cause and effect relationship helps us see how unrewarding old habits are, but it also helps us see how rewarding uh, some of these positive mm -hmm. habits are. So I just want to highlight that yeah. piece. Every time we're truly, say, generous with somebody, and we're not looking for something in return, like just true generosity, not looking for anything in return, how's it feel? Amazing. Yeah. So if we can really even just reflect on that and say, wow, you know, that felt really good that feeds that positive habit loop. Mm -hmm. um, same for kindness, same for connection. When we put away our phone and really have a conversation with somebody, it's as compared to having that phone burn a hole in our pocket and we notice what it just feels like to have a good connection, it makes it easier to put the phone away in the future. Yeah, yeah. okay. So how do we build a positive habit? It's through the awareness, again, same thing as anyone. Yep. Being aware of how it makes us feel, the bigger, better, uh, offer that we get from this and constantly doing it that it's a good habit it's a good reward not a negative reward yes yes and we can look for the contracted quality of experience versus the expanded quality of experience yeah. to see and sometimes they're mixed you know we might be holding the door for our boss and we might be like did did she actually did she notice that was i she, held the door was, for she, her? was she angry was she so, grateful yeah, yeah. yeah so we could look for that closed down piece and then look to see what it feels like when we just hold it wow. just out of pure kindness again you're sounding like a personal development guru over here you know <laughs> tony robbins would say like the the secret to living is giving mm. you know it's like the more we give the more we feel good about ourselves and not looking for something in return yeah. but whatever the weather it's science and the laws of the universe where it's something's going to come back in an abundant way when we create when we give when we offer value to other people yeah so. and, and it's beautiful to see how the science is actually backing that up right and yeah. so those things you know, <laughs> The giving has been around for thousands of years. People saying, you know, it's, it, generosity is good, you know, as compared to Gordon Gecko in Wall Street, greed is good. No, he was just addicted to money. Mm. Um, generosity is good thousands of years. Now we can see, oh, the science actually supports this. It's, you know, there's this rewarding quality that feels better when we're open, when we're connected as compared to when we're trying to hold on or get more. Mm. So the science, so you've done the research with this uh, habit of giving as well, or is that just We haven't there? yet, but I, that'd be a fun experiment to do. That'd be amazing. Yes. I love this, personal development, science coming together. Um, okay, is there anything else around positive habit building that we should know about? I think that's it. Okay. It's pretty simple. This is great, I love this conversation. Uh, this question is called the three truths. Okay. So imagine, uh, it's your last day on earth many years from now. You live as long as you want to live. It could be a couple hundred years, but eventually you got to go. And the physical form has got to leave. Okay. And you have achieved every dream you can think of. You have the life of your dreams. 
you find the research to positive giving, you find the solutions to spirituality, whatever you want to do, <laughs> you find the answers. Okay. And um, all this research is out there that you've created or your team has created with you. But for whatever reason, you've got to take the research with you. You've got to take all the content you've created, the TED Talks with tens of millions of views. They all got to go away. And you get to leave behind three things you know to be true about your life and your experiences that you would leave with all of us. Three lessons, or what I like to call us, three truths. And that's all you could leave behind. What would you say are your three truths? In no particular order, but maybe in this order. Number one, curiosity is key. I mean, if I had to condense everything that I've learned, both personally and scientifically, to one word, it would be curiosity. Mm. That curious awareness. It's sweet. It changes habits. <laughs> Just thinking about curiosity brings a smile to my face. So <laughs> I like that. That's number one. Probably no, number one, number two, and number three. Uh, but the other may sound a little more uh, like cliches, but they're still true for me. Mm -hmm. uh, that the kindness wins every time. Mm -hmm. You know, love trumps hate every time. And that also fits with the reward-based learning piece. So the science of that is, is beautiful yeah. as well. You know, I'm not. I'm gonna leave it at two, because I'm not sure what else there is besides curiosity and kindness. Mm. I mean, both of those lead to connection. So if I had to put a third in there, but as a result of the first two, is connection. As humans, when we connect with each other, even connecting with other beings like our yeah. you know, animals, pets, whatever, that's pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. So curiosity, kindness connection that's powerful how can we support you how can we get a hold of the the materials the assessments the apps where can we go to end the negative addictions and become more complete human beings without negative addictions I have a totally self-referential website called drjud.com, D-R-J-U-D.com, uh -huh. which has information. We have a bunch of free resources there, um, put out courses for healthcare providers that are all free, a bunch of videos that we've, and animations we've put together because it's just really fun to condense the science into sure. you know, <laughs> digestible bits and also the apps, you know, the Unwinding Anxiety app, the Eat Right Now app, and the Craving to Quit app. Those are all- They're all in the app store? They're all in the app store, but folks can find them directly through my website, website as well. Gotcha. And then I wrote a book called The Craving Mind if folks want to read more Great. about that brings in my personal journey with the scientific journey, which was fun to write as well. The Craving Mind. And I'll link all this stuff up on, my, on the show notes too. Um, I want to acknowledge you, Dr. Judd, for the ability to see your own addictions and dive into this to help not only yourself, but so many other people that you have the curiosity to say, why do I have these addictions? Why am I overthinking? Why am I obsessing over this? Why, you know, all these things that you talked about so that you could help heal and relieve pain for so many people in the world. It's amazing that you had that curiosity and you worked so hard over the years to do the research. Cause I can only imagine how much time that has taken you mm. to find the results and to find the research that proves these things scientifically decades of time and energy. So I thank you for your service, sacrifice, whatever you want to call it, for showing up and helping. And the results are, you know, helping a lot of people heal and feel at peace, which is what we're all looking to do is figure out how to, how to suffer less and have more peace and love in our heart. Like you said, kindness uh, and curiosity. So I'm very grateful and acknowledge you for that. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, it's an honor and a privilege, and it's been a wild ride so far. Yeah, and we're just getting started. Yes. You're just getting started. Um, this is my final question. It's what's your definition of greatness? Hmm. Egolessness. No ego. Mm -hmm. There you go. Dr. John, thanks, man. Appreciate you. Thank you.